you all understand English? No? Those who only speak Swedish can have a, a translator sit by them. Good morning and welcome, friends. I'm very happy to come back to Sweden, to Stockholm, and spend two days with you. The purpose of my coming here to see you is to share with you what experiences one can expect if one is on a spiritual path. A spiritual path is a very simple thing. It means you want to find what is your spirit, what is your soul, who are you really. It is obvious that we are sitting here alive because we have life in us. Life is spirit. Life is soul. If there is no soul, there is no life. Just a way of saying soul, it also means life. We are alive because our real self is life per se, without any covers. We can't imagine that. There is no way we can imagine that we could be life without any body, without any mind, without any sense perceptions. But that is the reality. The reality is we are conscious and aware of what is happening around us because we are alive and therefore we have a soul. The soul is very different from the mind. Very often we confuse the mind with the soul. The mind thinks, soul does not think. If soul wants to think, it uses the mind. Mind has been given to the soul for thinking. And when you think, you begin to understand the sense perceptions. The mind interprets sense perceptions. If we had no mind, we could not say, this is a cup of water. It would say there is something this shaped, round shaped, some kind of liquid inside, we'll never call it water. What has made the sense perception of looking at it, tasting it, feeling it, what has made it glass of water is the mind. Mind interprets sense perceptions. Sense perceptions to create a greater degree of reality operate in the physical body. So therefore, we have three covers upon our soul, upon life. First cover, mind. Thinking mind. Understanding mind. Interpreting mind. Second cover on top of the mind, sense perceptions, which make us see separately, hear separately, touch separately, smell separately. These five senses of perception are used by the mind to interpret what we understand of this whole world and what we understand about ourselves. Understanding per se comes from the use of sense perceptions and the mind. When these operate within a body, it gives a solid effect. And we think it's much more real because it is solid. If I want to know is this table real? I look at it. It could be hallucination. I would just be seeing something created by imagination. But then I touch it. Oh, it's real. I apply two senses and make it real. The sense of touch is possible because one of the five senses operating in my body and my hand, I can touch it. That is why we have created our reality outside of ourselves by using these wonderful gifts to us. Wonderful gifts given to the soul to experience an externalized reality. The gifts of a mind, gifts of sense perceptions, gifts of a human body. So this is a wonderful situation. But then there are negative aspects also. The negative aspects are that the mind does not always think very nice things, nor do the circumstances created in this real reality outside are very happy ones for us. We get disappointed. Friends leave us. We are unhappy. 
We love somebody so deeply, and one day the very person says, I don't love you. Imagine how heartbroken we get. Nothing to do with sense perception, it's in the mind. So we are sometimes experiencing very bad, unpleasant experiences from the very gifts we were given to enjoy a created reality. Therefore, there must be something in this reality of the physical material world where we should be able to get out if we are not happy. Then we look at our lives. And I have met thousands of friends. They look happy. They smile. Then I go and stay with them for two days. And I see how many problems they have. I see how unhappy they are in their relationships. I see how much disappointed they are, how much jealousy they have for other people who have better material things. I see how messy the life is. You can't see it clearly unless you know them intimately. And that is why this life of ours, wonderful though it may be, it's wonderful to experience life, it has two sides. A very nice positive side, which gives us pleasure and joy and happiness, and a very unhappy side. It's a combination. It is not true that some people are very happy, some are very unhappy. All are happy and unhappy. This was a great discovery I made, not just by sitting at home, but by doing a study at a university in the United States. I got a fellowship to study at Harvard University, one of the finest universities, the oldest university in the United States, and recognized all over the world. I was very lucky to get a fellowship to study there. And during the studies, they taught me economics, business, science, how to control water, many items, very interesting. Of course, material items. But there was also one study to show, to show what makes us happy. And I wrote a special paper on that. Before writing the paper, I decided to check out if my understanding of happiness is correct or not. So I opened the telephone book of the greater Boston area, since I was living in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Boston area is larger, and I picked up randomly 1,000 people to check up if they are happy or not. So I prepared a questionnaire. I asked them, are you happy or not happy? And tell us what makes you happy. On the reverse side, tell me what does not make you happy. I was surprised to see the uniformity of answers. What makes me happy? Lot of money, lot of dollars, lot of nice, beautiful house, wonderful children, good business, good job, all listed on the front page. On the back page was poverty, illness, bad health, and things like that. Then I asked for many of them, some who were actually from the faculty of the university and some outsiders, some business people, for interviews. One man had written the same thing and he had worked in the university as professor and now was heading a company as CEO and chairman of the company. And according to his disclosures, he had $10 million of assets, which according to me was pretty good money, 10 million US dollars. I interviewed him. I said, has money made you happy? Not at all. This is what his interview is saying. Why not? You said in your paper that money makes you happy. What happened? He said, do you know? Let me tell you. I went to the same university you have. I got a doctorate in the same university. I studied for 10 years and completed my education, worked very hard. 
and with all the qualifications, I got a job, saved money, I've got $10 million. Now look, look at my neighbor. Never went to school. Never spent any time in education. Just simple, some kind of petty business he's doing, he has $20 million. How can I be happy? <laughs> his happiness was dependent on his neighbor. So what he wrote became untrue because of neighborhood. Not only that, some people who said, we're happy to have nice children, and then I interviewed them. We have very nice children, but our older boy, you can't imagine such a rascal, gone off all track, is in drugs, is this, I've tried my best to take care of him, doesn't listen to me. What kind of child do I have? Others are good still. I said, they're still young. <laughs> this is what is the situation. Then I discovered, after a large number of interviews, that what makes us happy or unhappy are a set of two different things. The tangible ones, like money, property, house, car, and the intangible ones about happy relationships, happy, happiness at the job, contentment, promotions in job, things that are not really written in t tangible things, those are intangible. Disappointments in love, they're not part of the tangible things at all. But they were equally important. When I put the list together, I was very surprised that those who have a lot of tangible things for happiness had a lot of intangible things for unhappiness. Those who had very few tangible things for happiness had a large number of intangible happinesses. So it came to my mind that I should really study this little further. It was only a fellowship. I had good information. I went to India and went to a village. Very poor people lived there. But that was a village where their avatar, Krishna, who they worshipped, was born. They worked very hard all day, made a very meager income. In the evening, they sat and sang such beautiful songs. Their faces were lit up with happiness. Money didn't count at all for them. And that happiness was so great. Poverty was so much. Riches were so little. Happiness great. Here, riches high, happiness very little. I tried to develop some mathematical equations to put some values on different items of happiness different items of unhappiness. Result came out beautiful. We are all 50-50. Some have one kind of happiness, other kind of unhappiness. So we are living right now in this physical world of duality. What is duality? Two-ness. That means pairs of opposites. If there was no happiness, unhappiness would mean nothing. If there was no darkness, we would never see the light. Imagine what light we are seeing here. Supposing this light was visible, day and night, whether we open our eyes or close our eyes, you would never have seen light at all. We couldn't even define it. We won't even know what light is. Light is known because darkness can also be experienced. If, if you carefully examine all our life, you will find that it is based upon pairs of opposites. Scientists have gone to the extent that there cannot be matter unless there is anti-matter. They feel that, and they have experimented in Chicago, near Chicago. There's a lab called Fermi Lab. There they do, it's a collider, collider of particles. And there the particles collide, and they shoot out photons, electrons. They shoot out from both directions to collide and see if smaller particles are made. One of the main items was to study how small the smallest particle is. There are three such labs. One is, in United, one is in the United States. So I visited that and I saw two strange things. If two electrons, one created artificially for a nanosecond as antimatter, what's the difference between matter and antimatter? In matter, the electrons are flying around the positrons, which is the neutron and the positron in the center. The nucleus is positive, 
the outside is circulated by negative electrons makes matter antimatter the electron negative in the middle the positives move around when they put these two together they both completely disappear creating a sort of energy which is a new study they're studying what kind of energy is that which two collide they disappear oh, completely both of them it appears that every element of matter has been created by splitting some energy which creates matter and antimatter at the same time again pairs of opposites not only that they thought electrons are just unit of energy itself so they said let's collide a negative electron with a negative electron they sent a series of photons or electrons from one side series now they are not positive and negative so they don't disappear strange stranger thing happens and it's all being photographed by high high speed cameras when electron comes on one side to another in the same axis is coming this one disappears it passes it reappears don't don't collide we don't know where it goes how can such high speed they are moving at the speed of velocity of light how can such high speed moving electrons be so careful okay now another colliding electron is coming that disappear and reappear immediately after that this is puzzled scientists so much today that they believe that there are now more than the four dimensions which they thought constituted the world and when they examine the energy being generated at different levels of our globe in the in the cosmos around us you cannot prove where what they consist of great theories are coming about speculation maybe it is dark matter we can't see dark matter but something is there invisible functions like matter it has all the properties of matter except it's invisible the rest of matter is visible it cannot be detected by any any telescope that we have invented so far and yet we cannot account for the energy the radiations coming except by assuming it is dark matter so they at one time believed in the beginning of the theory of dark matter that must be 50 50 maybe there is the anti matter we were thinking of and we can't see it now no new studies reveal the dark matter is much larger than the visible matter and studies 2 years ago con contemplated that the dark matter is much more the visible matter is only 17% of the available observation of the cosmos last year they published another paper it was much less this year they published a paper it's only 3% 3% is visible matter 97% is invisible matter it's called matter and it's all around us here what's going on what do we know about it we know very little we have lot of studies to make what is space time big question we have always thought that space time can be understood very easily newtonian physics the time of newton space was a very wonderful open thing in which matter existed and large matter pulled small matter apple fell from the tree and he created his theory of gravity that a large earth pulled a small apple and it dropped to the earth einstein came another great genius who said newton was all wrong nobody pulls nobody it just so happens he came up with dramatic new information based on mathematical calculations not based on speculation of philosophic ideas based on mathematical calculations based on what he could study at the radiations of different kinds in the cosmos he came to the conclusion that space bends if you put matter in it that's strange space is emptiness according to us 
He said space is the hardest thing that exists. By different definition. What is the definition of hardness? Our idea is table is very hard. Well, maybe it does approximate a little bit. Because if I hit from this side, this hit of mine will go down the table. We don't know how far. If it's made of cotton wool, it won't go, go down at all. If it's hard, it will go down further. Steel, if I hit from one side, will go much further. It is only space that exists in the whole universe. You hit here and the hit will go several hundred million miles away. So it must be the hardest thing. Otherwise, how can you hit with a radioactive wave and it can be transmitted to the planets and to the galaxies today? So that is why he had a new concept about space. One concept he introduced was that time and space are one unit. He called them continuum. That time cannot be separated from space. <coughs> Supposing you have no time, there's no space. Supposing there's no space, there's no time. You have to have both to have the kind of space-time continuum we are living in. He came up with this wonderful method, said because matter creates a curvature in space, therefore light, which he found was the only constant, when it travels through space, because of the curvature of space, it also curves. Otherwise, traveling in straight line in space, but space is curved, light can curve. It was this discovery of his, which led to the discovery of our ninth planet, Pluto, because he found that, this, that the light had bent there, therefore there must be something there, and then the ninth planet was discovered. His contribution is very great today, they can't deny what he said was right, but they have advanced further upon that. The current thinking is that space-time are very strange because if space-time is one thing only, a continuum, in space I can go there and come back. In time I cannot. Why is the difference? If it is time is merely an ordinate of space, why should I not be able to go tomorrow and come back to yesterday? It's the same thing. Only last month, papers have been published in scientific magazines and journals with the new experiments where they found a particle existing in the future and a particle existing in the present and a particle existing in the past are occurring at the same time. Therefore, they have now come to the conclusion that space-time is only a fixed static thing and past, present and future all exist at the same time and the events are already placed on those. A concept which had been mentioned in the Indian Eastern spiritual literature 3,000 years ago, a concept I have been talking of for the last 50 years, that time does not move. Me, we move on time. All events on time are already placed. When we talk of, are things already predetermined or are they happening now? This concept, both from physics and from our old knowledge of metaphysics, says predetermination is because time has existed static from the beginning of creation. A great discovery. But there's something interesting about time. And I, I wonder if you will enjoy my little explanation of time. They say, we live in the now. N-O-W, big word, now. Somebody sent me a book, whole book saying, live in the now. I wondered if somebody not living in the now. I never met anybody not living in the now. Everybody is in the now. What's the, what's the big deal? Somebody telling me, live in the now. I said, where am I living? Are you living somewhere else? Is it now the only present we live in? Is there any other place where you can live in? What's gone is past. What has not come is future. We are living in the now. Now imagine how much time is there in now in which we are all living. Before I can utter the word now, it is future. The moment I start uttering it is past. Where is the time in now? 
Time has not even a billionth second of a nanosecond. It's not, there is no time at all in now. Yet we are all experiencing time. I'm saying I came at this time, I'll walk, talk for an hour and go back. All this is based on time, all on the passage of time. And all being done in now. Now we have no time at all. A very interesting study. How we can be living in a timeless state and still think we are in time. What's the reason? The reason is that we are considering the immediate past. Few seconds gone as now. I said now, I said in the present. Not truly. I said in the past. Actually, I said everything in the past. But it looks like now, because we are misinterpreting the immediate past as now. Immediate past has time, because I can put the things together. I walked here, I can remember. My memory can tell me that there was an immediate past. Can anything else tell me that there was an immediate past? No way. There's no way of knowing there was an immediate past except your memory. Therefore, what is creating the experience of now is immediate memory. What we call past at present is only past, being recovered through immediate memory. What about future? Maybe future exists from where all this is coming through and passing through us in the immediate present. Future does not exist. If we remove three words from all dictionaries of the world, and remove three functions of the mind. Hope, fear, anticipation. When we hope for something, or fear something, or anticipate something will happen, future is created in our mind. There's no future otherwise. Think of it, if these functions were not in the human brain, would there be a future? Would anybody experience a future at all? Now, hoping takes time. Fearing takes time, anticipating takes time. Actually, there's the same thing. They all anticipation. One is positive, we call it hope. One negative, we call it fear. This whole process that's going on in our head is creating a sense of future. Nobody's seen it. We're just speculating all the time, very often projecting our immediate experience of the past into the future. And all these three functions need time and are part of the immediate past. Study very carefully, you will find what we have been calling future has been the past. What I have been calling present is also the past. Past is past. And all of them are being recovered by memory and no other means. If anybody can tell me there is another way of explaining, I will happily accept it. I have studied this for a long time. That we do not understand that time is an experience generated by memory. If this is true, you can't have a memory if nothing existed. How is past being created? How can you have a memory being created if nothing ever happened? So it has to be created somewhere. Yes, we can create a memory. We can shoot a movie. And when the movie is all short picture is ready, say we went to holiday and shot a movie, and then we played the movie, and we can see everything once again. When we see it all again, it's a movie. It's not real. You are watching on a screen. <laughs> Supposing you don't watch on a screen, two-dimensional screen, but watch it, what they call virtual reality. Your own movie, virtual reality, four-dimensional movie. Do you know life will be exactly the same as we are seeing now? No difference whatsoever. That are we sure it's something new going on here? Or is it just a recording somewhere in four or maybe 11 dimensions? Currently, physicists have come to explain that all the radiation and all the study of energy cannot be explained away unless there are at least 11 dimensions, not four or five. If that is so, could it be such a wonderful, delicately created movie which works, works in 11 dimensions, and we are in it. How did we get the movie? When we go, I went to, once when I was a little younger, 
very fascinated by going to uh, Disney World where, or Universal Studios or some place where they were shooting a film. And when you saw, you were also in it. They shot you separately and another movie, you became an actor in that movie. It looked so funny. I, I was not there, but I'm seeing it. Here, not only seeing it, we are in it. We are right there. Now, that's a very subtle point. For serious examiners, serious people who want to understand how this life is being created, how, is it, how much of it is a replay, how much, how much of it is new, you can go and examine all these things. Which is the best place to examine this reality of our experiences? Best place to examine the reality of experiences where we are actually watching the experience, where we are going through the experience, sense perceptions, mind. Start from the mind. Study how the mind works. So little work has been done in psychology to study the mind by simple examination of outside behavior. It's terrible that they are confined to such a small slice of knowledge about the mind. They could study a lot more. Not by behavior, studying how the mind works. Right now, the only way they think we can study is to study the structure of the brain, gray matter, take a lot of pictures of the brain, and little changes are happening. Somebody is very jealous. We can't see any evidence. Why can't we see evidence of jealousy? That's also in the mind. Somebody is very happy. If he's behaving happy, yes, you can see. If he's behaving jealous, yes, we might see some movement there. If he's jealous and not behaving jealous, you can't see anything. But jealousy is being felt very badly by that person. Why does the brain show it? The brain is only showing what has already been translated from the function of the brain to a behavior. That's all the study. They have no idea that you can examine a lot more. I am suggesting a simpler way to them. Don't take too many pictures of the brain. Just watch the function of the brain yourself. Function of the brain is inside your head, not outside. Your thoughts are taking place in the head, known very well. If somebody were to say, in this body, if I am only a unit of life, spread out in the whole body, where is it operating from? It doesn't take very long. It's operating from the head, from the brain, and spread out through the spine, the nervous system. That's everything is working. Very simple. It is in the brain. Studies are going on. What makes us conscious? What makes us alive and conscious? And what is unconsciousness? We give anesthesia, a person becomes unconscious. We go to sleep, we are unconscious of the body, maybe conscious of a dream or something. How does this happen that we can experience consciousness and unconsciousness? Not, no final answer yet found. Speculation is, it's the center of the brain. They are regarding a couple of glands in the very middle. The most central gland is a body hanging in the medulla oblongata called the pituitary body. Next to it is a small gland called the pineal gland. Studies are going on now. What is the role of these? They found the pineal gland is responsible for all hormonal activities in the whole body. Small little gland. Pituitary body in the center is responsible for making us conscious. When I was working with the government in India, a very important VIP, a, a, President of another country visiting us. He had a car accident, became unconscious. We are very embarrassed that such a great VIP has come and he is unconscious. We got the best doctors from the world. And those who had performed thousands of brain surgeries, they came up and they examined. And what is the state of the coma? What is the state of their unconsciousness? One brilliant guy, he said to my boss, who was the Prime Minister at that time, he said, Sir, Prime Minister asked, what causes consciousness? He said, Sir, we have been examining this question for thousands of years. We haven't found an answer yet. 
All I can say is that when we use laser probes, the only area is the pituitary body. When we put it on that, the man becomes unconscious. So we know that has to do something with it, but you're still not finally sure. Imagine if that is the place. Can we see it? Can we examine it for our old self? Can we see our own pituitary body inside? Can we go there? Now come the big question. How do we go anywhere without using a physical body? There's no way we can open our uh, head and see where it is. With these eyes, we can't see. With these eyes, we can't even see our own eyes, except in a mirror. Very difficult to see like that. But we can do one thing, and that is to use some very beautiful gifts given to us as human beings. The gift is consciousness, which means we can be aware through consciousness. Awareness, which creates a present experience of ours. I'm aware you're sitting here. You are aware I'm talking to you from here. The picture of my teacher, my great master here. We are aware of it. And then the most beautiful thing out of awareness, attention that we can place our attention where we like. And I place my attention on these beautiful flowers. Supposing I were looking at them, examining everything with full attention, I'll not be conscious of you. Slowly, I'll not even know who is here. I'll be so involved with attention on this flower. What is that? The power to concentrate our attention is a gift to us. According to me, the best gift in human life. The power to have attention by which you can narrow down your observation and experience of part of awareness which you like and the power to concentrate your attention there so that you can become relatively unaware of other things. If attention is strong, you can be unaware completely of other things. In a beautiful way. Now let's try a practical way to examine our consciousness through this method of applying attention. Attention can be placed anywhere. Let's put our attention on the pituitary body inside, at the center of the head, behind these eyes. <coughs> Approximate idea, I can tell you where it is. If you draw two lines behind the eyes and draw a straight line between the ears and where the two lines are crossing, makes a little bench, you're sitting right on that. What is the importance of that point? The importance is when we are in a wakeful physical state, we operate from there anyway. We are right now operating from there as units of consciousness, units by which we are understanding everything. Therefore, it's a very important point. Since it's located behind the eyes, often that point has been called the third eye. The hear of third eye it's not a real eye. It's only the two eyes can only see from the third eye, even now. The two eyes don't see the same thing. One eye sees one thing, the other eye sees something else. You can place a finger in front of you, you see two fingers. One more dominant than the other. One eye seeing more than the other eye. If you look at distance, there's only two fingers. You look at the finger, everything is distant, only one eye. How do you make two eyes into one? by putting your attention together. If you put attention together from there, attention is operating from there, and you're putting your attention together to look at things and create distance because of two eyes, where are you actually seeing from? Third eye center. In the brain, in the center. It's not an eye. It's a place where we see. I could go in great description to you how the light falls on the eyes and the retina picks up the image which is extension of the optic nerve, how the optic nerve ends up there and that is why the actual picking up of an image, what we are seeing, takes place at third eye center even now. I'm pointing this out because many people think that when we do meditation at a third eye center, we have to search where it is. No searching is required. You operate from there if you are awake. If you are sleeping, you can't search it. If you're dreaming, you can't search it. If you're at any other level of awareness, unaware of the physical body, you can't search it. It's only in one state. 
when we are in a physical body in a state of wakefulness we are doing everything not only seeing from the third eye center you can study it further and come to the same conclusion so third eye center is in the middle the very place from where thoughts emerge very place from where attention emerges now if you want to study what is attention how does it come where does it come from what is consciousness what is awareness the best place to study is from where it's coming out best place is to study at the third eye center the center of your head it's nothing external at all it's everything internal you are using your attention into your head into your place but can we really put our attention inside not easily why not easily if we can put attention on the flowers i can put attention on this microphone i can put attention on all of you why can't i put my attention on the third eye center simple we have lived our life focusing attention on something we have trained our attention to be used for focusing on things and then concentrating read a book focus your attention on the book look at something focus your attention there talk to somebody be attentive there what does that mean attention flows outward from that point from third eye center attention has always flown outside maybe how many lifetime we have lived with that we have trained our mind all the time to move attention from where it originates to outside now we are saying let's put the attention where it originates this is not a process of focusing attention at all it's a process of withdrawing your attention that's where we are caught up and not getting successful results people don't withdraw attention in all their meditation exercises they try to focus attention somewhere even in the head if i suggest to somebody focus attention on your own self from where you are currently thinking they close their eyes make an image of themselves and they say that's me sitting inside in the dark hollowness of the head and i'm trying to look at that self that is not yourself at all yourself is the one that's looking at that image and we can't withdraw there at all so used to focusing attention even when we say want to focus attention on ourselves we have to create somebody why do we have to create we are the one looking it's very important subject i am telling you the subject of an experiencer and experience experiences change experiencer never changes creation changes self never changes that observe that creation or lives through it have you ever noticed that if you are dreaming who is the character that is yourself in the dream you wake up is it the same character that self never changes supposing you have a different experience of a different form of yours you become a cloud you will be a cloud which is still the same self self never disappears self never changes all experience around it changes it's a remarkable thing to to know and to experience therefore every time the experiencer is the real one and not the experience there was a great wonderful master in india simple man very simple his name was baba fakir chand i lived in the same town and went to school and part of college in the same town where he lived our neighbor i used to go and hear his discourses he was the only known saint who declared again and again i know nothing is what you experience something is yours how can i tell you and some people have commented he was the only honest saint <laughs> others have claimed they have something he is the only one who said i know nothing at all what you are having is your experience i attended one of his discourse several discourses of his when he used to talk like this people missed out what he was trying to say he was saying 
that if you are able to experience the experiencer, which cannot be called experience, you cannot say I experience the experiencer. The experience is always separate. Experience is what the experiencer is experiencing. Two words cannot be combined. He said, people told me, my masters told me, my gurus told me, accomplished enlightened people told me that you will get great experiences if you withdraw your attention within. He said, I did everything and got great experiences, out-of-body experiences, experiences of heavens, experiences of light all over, experiences never had in the physical world. But it never came to the truth because it was all experience. Even the highest experience is not the truth. Experiencer is the truth. It's so hard to find. The experiencer is, is the one. We are here, all experiencers. We are the self. And we can't find the self. We can't know what the self is. Amazing situation we are in, that we are that which we are looking for. Why are we in such confusion? If we are that, which is our goal to find out, where is the big deal? The big deal is that we do not consider ourselves that. Just because we happen to be using a vehicle to experience something different, we are thinking we are the vehicle. We don't do it all the time. When we drive a car, driving a car, we don't become the car. We are using it. But we do not realize the body we are using is just like a car. We're sitting in a driver's seat at behind the eyes in the third eye center as using the body. We think body is ourself. The mistake is not our not being aware of ourself. If we weren't aware of ourselves, the world would disappear. The difficulty is we are misidentifying the self with something else, the body. We think this is the self. It's only being used. And yet we read in all religions. All spiritual literature, the soul, source of life, is immortal. Was never born, will never die, all those kind of wonderful descriptions. That's our self. How can it apply to the body? It's born, grows, dies quickly in 100 years, so at cosmic time is billions of years. How can we call this body of ours, our self? It's so short-lived, temporary. Temporary housing. Great vehicle, of course. Wonderful vehicle. It is so wonderful if I try to describe you the beauty of this body, it take me hours and hours. Even to describe the physiology of the body takes hours and hours, and that's a remarkable miracle. But when I describe how consciousness operates in the body, the greater miracle. It's very hard to explain how beautiful this body is. It's still a body, not the self. But that's the confusion. We identify ourselves with the body. Then some enlightened people come into our life. If we are seekers, they don't come into our life if we are not seekers. We go and enjoy the world. We think we are the body. We have been born. We have to look, do the best in the world. One day we will die and finish. Game is over. Whether this is afterlife or not, we don't know. Whether there was a past life or not, we don't know. All we know is this is one life which we can see, experience, remember. So therefore, we caught up in this thing, misidentification of consciousness with the body. Of course consciousness is operating in the body. Of course it is making us a living body. Of course it is making us a conscious, aware body. Aware of not only the body, but ourselves, outside the experiences. A big, big miracle. But to say this is the body is not. When one, somebody wants to seek what is inside that we call immortal, that we call spirit, that we call soul? What is that and where does it lie? Then we try to find something inside. Enlightened people come and they say, you can find if you meditate. If you meditate within yourself. The whole truth of your own true self is within you. So we try to meditate. Maybe if I can find out who I am inside, somebody saying, meditate within, I'll close my eyes. Try to see. Try to see very hard. Got a headache. Darkness, headache. Will I continue? 
That's the experience of most people. They are told the truth is inside. Meditate and close your eyes and put your attention inside. I close my eyes, try hard. Can't see anything. I make up some imaginary figures, imaginary numbers, imaginary images. Sometimes people tell me, you know, I meditated inside long periods. I could see some right red light. I could see some blue light. I said, if I knock you on the head, you'll see the same light right now. What are you talking about that you see red light or blue light and you got enlightened? What knowledge did you get of yourself? None. So we give up. It's very simple. So many of us have tried and given up because we saw nothing. How can you see? When you close your eyes, at least with eyes open, I can see something. With closed eyes, I can see nothing. Where did the fault lay? The fault lay in that I was still trying to see with the eyes which are closed. These eyes won't see if they are closed. They were not meant to be see, seeing anything with eyes closed. But there is another eye which we use all the time, without difficulty, without headache, without closing our eyes. Another eye called the eye of imagination. They imagine things, we can see them. Which eye is seeing them? Right now, I can see a big white elephant standing outside. Just outside the big white elephant. How many of you can see? Oh, good. Some of you can see with your eyes without, without the elephant being there, without using these eyes. The eyes of imagination are not the physical eyes at all. And yet we all have them. We all use them. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we can use those eyes to see and not the eyes of the physical body. Takes a little time to switch, I must tell you. Because imagination, we have practiced. Imaginative viewing, we have practiced for a long time. But to see our own self and what's happening inside our head with imagination is a different job. It can be done, can be practiced. But the means we have already. Now, if you were to close your eyes, and not try to look anything with these eyes, they are closed. But with your imagination, you imagine there are things happening in front, you can see them very easily. Where are those imaginative eyes? Who has them? Yourself. Nobody else. There's nobody else there. You are the only one there. You close your eyes, you are the only one inside. And you have eyes to imagine things. Now, supposing you imagine that you are sitting in the head and you make a little picture. That picture is not you, but what about the one looking at the picture? Supposing you were to say, I am looking at a picture, but who is looking? You will withdraw. Not easy to begin with. Very easy with little practice. And the practice is simple. The practice is not even to withdraw attention there, but to say, where am I sitting? Imagine, where are you sitting with eyes closed? You draw your attention to the third eye center. If some aids are given, some methods are designed, there are a lot of methods designed to imagine more easily where you're sitting. Supposing you can use those aids, which I can explain, with those aids you can actually imagine you are sitting there, then you find you are sitting there, who is imagining? There's nobody else to imagine. Imagination is only a very small tool to begin. But once you are there, and then put attention on that self of yours. How? By doing things inside. Dancing, for example. We can dance inside. We can walk, talk, fly, do anything we like. It's imaginary. Imaginary is imagination, not the stuff we're looking at. We are looking at who is doing it. Is it the same self that's looking out with these eyes or different? Same self. Self never changes. Therefore, when we imagine we are there and start doing activities within that space, not this space. You know you can create as much space as you like inside. In dreams, you have so much space and time. I was talking to some friend the other day in the 60s. When I came to, went to United States first time, 
I went to some sleep clinics, dream clinics. They were studying how dreams take place. Those are still studying even today in a much more scientific way how dreams occur. Do the images of dreams come from actually an existing state of being and so on. There are many studies going on. But the biggest study was that time in the dream is totally unrelated to the time in wakeful state. That you can have a three-minute dream and live three years. In one particular subject in, that was being examined at that time, a man went to sleep and he remembered he was a child going to school. He remembered carrying books to school. He remembered meeting a girl, sweetheart of school days, growing up, married, marriage took place. He could see the whole wedding. He remembered all the guests of the wedding. And then he had children. Then he grew old, then he had grandchildren. And then he died. As he was dying, he woke up. His whole life in seven minutes. Explanation is very simple. That you never see the whole sequence, you see flashes, one flash after the other, and that makes up your time in a dream. If you can have a state of wakefulness higher than this wakeful state, if you can wake up more, one more time, you will find this world is also stacked with static images. Not a few, billion, trillions of them stacked so closely, they are creating a sense of time and movement, like a movie. When you watch a movie, nothing is moving. Nothing moves at all except the, maybe the movie camera. Now that we don't have digital system, does not even require that. You can see movement one image at a time. I got a, a TV by LG, LG Group. LG is a very difficult word in Japanese, but they call it life is good. Anyway, that's okay. It's for the TV. So I realized that it has it's very beautiful colors in that TV. And they use three primary colors. In every spot, in every little thing, piece, piece of that, they were using three colors. And how many colors do you think they were able to generate from three colors by different combinations? If they had said 200, I would be very impressed. No, the number was 16,000 in that particular TV. Now in digital cameras which are being used or telescopes which are being used, we can create billion colors out of three. The combinations range so much. So when I saw that this can be done in such great intricacy, I discovered that where is coming from all the observation of those colors by the self. The question is, is the self creating those colors? Or the colors have to exist on a TV screen for me to see? Very old question. Philosophers have asked for a thousand years. Am I looking at a tree? They use the symbol of a tree. I can use any symbol. They say, are we looking at a tree because the tree is there? Or the tree is there because we are looking at it? It's creating, the looking is creating the tree. Answer was, it's a question of cause and effect. That looking comes first or tree comes first? Oh, tree has to be brought in front of you to look at it. The tree is real. Looking is just an experience of yours of the tree, which is outside. No, but the one who brought the tree is also experience of the tree. What about the total experience? Are you generating it in the head or it's outside? Those who believe it is outside, and we call them materialists today in philosophy, the materialistic philosophy says material must exist. We are only recipients of what comes through sense perceptions into ourselves. The opposite view is, no, this could all be created within ourselves, and therefore we think it's real because we check the reality by one sense and the other created outside. Which one is true? On the principle of cause and effect, that which comes first is a cause. In current time thinking, what comes later is the result of its effect. When they examined, do I see the tree first or the tree come first, they found it is completely simultaneous. There is no time lag at all. Which of the two? Question remains unanswered. 
वी कॉन्ट आंसर ट्री इज रियल और वी आर रियल टू सी द ट्री बट देर इज अ वे टू फाइंड आउट बेटर देन दैट बेटर देन स्पेकुलेशन एंड दैट इज टू सी वॉट हैपन्स इन साइड वेन वी सी अगेन सेम थिंग लेट्स गो टू दि सोर्स ऑफ आवर एक्सपीरियंस लेट्स गो टू दिस सेंटर ऑफ आवर हेड लेट्स गो टू थर्ड आई सेंटर एंड फ्रॉम देयर एग्जामिन वेरी स्ट्रेंज एक्सप्लेनेशन कम अप अनबिलीवेबल दैट वी क्रिएट द यूनिवर्स दैट वी क्रिएट ऑल एक्सपीरियंसिस वी क्रिएट एवरीबडी वी क्रिएट एवरीथिंग नॉट फ्रॉम आउटसाइड नॉट फ्रॉम द बॉडी not from our senses not from our mind but from consciousness itself now this can be explained in a slightly different way how do we see rays of light we have to have light to see first requirement is totally dark you don't see so far as physical eyes are concerned light is essential ingredient of seeing light falls on a subject light falls on these flowers what do the flowers do they absorb out of the ra- rainbow colors of the light which are all seven colors there it they absorb most of the colors and cannot absorb some colors this this leaf here absorbed all the colors except green so it became green why did that happen this particular object abs- absorbed colors but could not absorb green green reflected back to me and enters my eyes and by vitreous aqueous humor and the lens these three functioning together made a picture of this leaf on my retina that's the, you can see it it's actually happening like that unfortunately made upside down picture but that doesn't matter sometimes people have questioned the medical sciences how come that the lenses operate to create an upside down image yet we see straight straight we don't see exactly as the retina is seeing the answer very very child like answer we get used to seeing it upside up uh, straight and not upside down anyway there must be some better reason than that but what happens next what is the retina the retina is merely an extension of the co- optic nerve which contains rods and cones one makes the shapes one makes the color and all the things appear as they are appearing now and the leaf appears on my on my retina i see the color and the shape and the optic nerve conveys that message so nervous signal a nerve signal is sent to the brain at the optic center in the brain and if i am awake i'll see it if i'm sleeping i won't see it if i'm conscious i will see it if i'm not conscious i won't see it consciousness that picks up from the brain as if there is a leaf now let's say supposing our retinas have been created with this with this faculty with this capability of creating all sorts of images special retina that create images and that my retina created an image of a leaf green leaf i would still see it here exactly because rest of the process is the same the retina is picking up what is exactly outside and conveying exactly what's inside supposing retina does nothing it's only the optic nerve or the optic center that does it from the brain i still see the leaf exactly as i'm seeing now supposing it's not even the optic center not even the brain supposing it's consciousness that last picks up and makes it a leaf of a tree i'll still see it exactly the same therefore even this question in medical sciences is pending an answer do we see through consciousness do we experience everything through consciousness where it is being generated or consciousness merely receiving end answers can be found if we study consciousness a little deeper in fact i was so impelled when i was very young to write about this i said i'll write a book and i called it the anatomy of consciousness i will study what consciousness in all its forms how it operates 
I wrote one line. We are alive because we are conscious. I couldn't find a second line. The book remained there. <laughs> then many years later, I gave a lot of talks on consciousness, and they got transcribed, they were got recorded, and somebody compiled them, and my wife found them out, and she didn't like me to talk these things. She thought I'm really talking as if I've got real, some real knowledge inside, which I don't really have. And therefore she said, people get misled by listening to you, that maybe you have some enlightenment or something, all you have is good talk. So you should be not giving that impression to people. So somehow, I don't know how her mind changed, she picked up that one book with one line written by me and began to take up from the transcriptions and my tapes and completed the book, mostly from my tapes. Some she added from other te teachings of so Buddhism and so on. So the anatomy of consciousness she published secrecy and one day presented to me, this is your book. In the foreword to the book, she did add at the end, the author knows, knows very well my hates and loves and hates about the subject. And that's also still in the book. But the question was, consciousness is a very interesting and deep subject. It's a subject of our own self. It's a subject of who we are. If we can study who we are as consciousness, we study who the self is. All experiences are there because we are conscious. So that is why if consciousness generates everything, how can we practically see it? How can we practically see how sense perceptions work? I just gave an example that we use imagination in which we use all five sense perceptions. In the meditation exercises we do, some opening exercise I do is, I put a, these flowers and a, and a snack on the table and say, you imagine your own flowers your own snack, your own drink in your head. And then one by one I tell them to taste it. Now you check out, touch it, taste it, smell it. Do all the five senses and they are able to do all of them. And then we check what flower did you see? Not the ones we imagined. <laughs> Those were brilliant with light coming. They had experiences which are so different from what they want to imagine. Did you like the taste of the drink? Very good, it, I never had it before. How can that happen? If you are only using your own memory of your own stuff which you have actually experienced, how can you try to make the same imagination, trying to imagine the same things come up with so much difference? That means there is something functioning in us which is not generating purely from physical memory something, but something slightly different. And when you hear this from hundreds of people. And so many of them say, we saw flowers that were emitting light, colors were light, lighted up. These flowers never do that. Boy, where are those flowers from? Where are we seeing them? There was a Chinese philosopher, Fahin. Fahin, when he slept, had a dream. In the dream, he felt he was a butterfly. And he was flying in a garden. Flowers were so beautiful, emitting lights and colors. That's what he records. That he said, this is definitely more real than my physical life. He felt so real, more real than his physical life. He said, this is a reality I found out today. And he flipped his fingers, uh, I mean his, fla his wings of a butterfly. He was flapping those fla uh, wings of his, uh, as a butterfly. Then he woke up. And he thought, am I really a butterfly? Now dreaming I am a man and a philosopher? Or am I a man and a philosopher dreaming that I was a butterfly? So he told his intimate friends. He said, I had this dream. The dream sequence was more real than this world. Flowers were so different from the flowers I've seen. I couldn't even imagine them. Am I really a butterfly? Or am I a human being? His friends told him, don't be stupid, that was just a dream. You are not a butterfly, and you can't say actually that you flew as a butterfly. You saw a butterfly in your dream. 
He said, I never saw any butterfly. I didn't see any butterfly. I didn't even see myself, but I was a butterfly. I was flapping my wings. And I was seeing with my eyes as butterfly, all those flowers. I didn't see myself, but I was a butterfly. How did you know? If you are a human being, and you have a dream that you are flying as a butterfly, how can you say it's yourself? You're not a butterfly. So I was a butterfly. I experienced it. I flew with my wings. No, same self. The, the point he was making is that the self in a human body became butterfly, but the self remained the same. No change. Form changed from human to butterfly. Therefore, that was a short experience to say form does not matter. Self remains the same. If you can discover the self, you discover the experiencer, you discover the reality, because everything can be destroyed except the experiencer, the self. Self is immortal, not, we call it soul, just, we call it soul to differentiate it from the covers upon that soul. If you successfully meditate according to the teachings of people who are enlightened, and they tell you, this is not your body. Your real self is inside. And you, by careful practice, withdraw your attention and become unconscious of the physical body, but still in the body, only working on awareness. You become aware of something that you are inside and become unaware of the body. What will open up? What do you expect will happen? If you open up and you are right now able to imagine things, you are able to not only imagine, see in imagination, touch in imagination, smell in imagination, do everything in imagination you are doing here. If you become unaware of this body but are still awake, awake not sleep or dream, you are awake, you are conscious, you are deliberately doing something, what will happen? You will find that you can still see. Have you ever imagined that the imaginative body can sometimes see very clearly? Have you ever tried, if you're old like me, like I, I am old, I have to use glasses to read. If you are, if you are reading in imagination, you have 20-20 vision. Ever imagine that? That if you look at who is working experiencer, not of the body, experiencer of your imagination, you have such fine sense perceptions, absolutely perfect sense perceptions, that you are imperfect in the body. You know, try it out. If we are able to really meditate to the extent that we become unaware of our body, which is the method, correct method, of trying to discover one step, we will find we can see, touch this much better than we can do with the body. Who is that being? But if we try to walk with that body, so easy. In your imagination you can fly. Will that body fly? Yes. Will it have any matter in it? No. Has any imaginative body ever have matter in it? No. Can you touch it? Only if you are in that state. Is it possible that the experience you are having of a separate form of yourself without matter, it has no physical matter, no atoms or molecules at all, yet it has all the sense perceptions, and you feel that you have hands and legs and limbs, though you can feel they are not there or they are there, but you can see very clearly, you can hear clearly. You can use sense perceptions clearly and no matter what would you be like. Let us imagine that we were like that before we were born. And just that form of sense perceptions entered at birth or the, at the fifth month of pregnancy at the time of quickening that we decided that it was our destiny 
and I'll talk about destiny also, how destinies are created, how destiny came, that we have to be born in this place with this mother. And we got into the trap, small, because we were big. We were thinking that we can move around, walk. And then we got trapped inside. And we grew slowly, became bigger and bigger, were born. Same self. Now we are confined to a body. And when this body dies, that slips out again, same way. If it slips out again, it will be able to see, touch, taste, smell, but have no matter in it. Can we verify that disembodied spirits are also there? Because if such a body exists and we die, it must be roaming around somewhere. Unless it is dead along with the physical body, then it's gone. If it survives, it should be there somewhere. People say, a lot of my friends tell me, one woman said, I can, my mother died, I can feel her presence in my house every day. There's a friend of mine in Chicago, and he had to buy a house. He looked at many houses. The realtor kept on telling him, there's a good house for you. No, not that good. Suddenly he said, one old lady has died. And her children don't want to even come and look at the house. They want to sell at a cheap price. Good bargain available. Should I buy? He asked, I buy. And he bought the house straight away. The lady died. Children never came. And all her property, even her unopened computer she had bought, unopened lying in the house, all furniture intact. When he came from outside a few days later, he saw a rocking chair rocking by itself. He got frightened. There's nobody here or somebody is hiding here who just ran away after rocking the chair. But the rocking chair and slight opening of the door especially to his bedroom when he was with somebody, bothered him a lot. He said, that lady is still here. Better come and tell her to go. They thought that I can tell people in disembodied spirits to go. Sometimes I try, it works also, sometimes. He had those experiences, light sometimes coming on, lights going off, little, little, not very heavy stuff. Simple stuff. And I went to his house. I said, let's see if it's really somebody disembodied. You can't see. And if the old lady is saying, why didn't my kids, why didn't my kids take my things? She was expecting the kids would live there. She's so disappointed. She doesn't want to leave your place. That may be the reason. Anyway, we went to the place. My wife and I went. He said, which is her favorite, you, where you see her or feel her most? He said, I don't see her clearly at all, but I feel she's moving around, I can tell you. Mostly I see a little, on a little piece of furniture. He said, put the furniture in my car. And we took it to our house. Peace was restored in his house. And lights began to flicker in my house. <laughs> little, little sounds would come. I could hear, my wife could hear sometimes, try to say, just very brief voice would sometimes say, just near us, I am here. Only these words. And we could hear, then nobody. Are we imagining, two of us together imagining something? He didn't know. But slowly we got to the impression that how is she actually moved. But after two months, nothing was happening in the house. He complained, she has come back. <laughs> My chair has started rocking again. He got frightened. I am never frightened by these events. I, I like to see them. I like to invite these people. I have sometimes invited them to my meetings. And some, some have died for a while and still they can come in this disembodied form. So what is the state? Can we see them? We can't see them because they are not made of matter. We only see matter. But we have power to see. Supposing 
we are also in the same state that they are in, we'll be able to see them. And even though we are not dead, we are not like them, we can have an experience called dying while living. In the Bible, Paul says, I die daily. It doesn't mean there's physical death. It's only an, an only a way of saying that I can be in a form other than the physical body. Now, let me tell you, all of you can experience this. Method is very simple. Withdraw your attention from the physical material world, from your physical material body, to the imaginative self that sits inside at the third eye center. And there are very good techniques to do it and very good helps that we can use to do that, which is, of course, the training of meditative exercises. But you can do that and you can then feel you have the power of seeing, touching, tasting, smelling without physical body. You can see all those people. Okay, you are in the same form as they are. And we all have that form inside us. It's not unique to anybody. It doesn't require some specialist to come and do this. Anybody can do it by simple exercise of being unaware of the physical body and yet aware of our sense perceptions can do that. That is why we can see disembodied spirits if we are in disembodied state. To die while living is a process of meditation. It's just called like that. True meditation is that. True meditation not to just have a certain calmness about your worldly jobs or to get away from stress and so on. True meditation is to be able to withdraw your attention to the point where you can be totally unaware of the physical body and still fully aware of yourself as sense perceptions. What should we call that body? We call it sensory body. Very often that form of ours is called the astral body. Astral word has been used because the feeling at that time is we, are, we can see stars which are not these stars. We can see flowers which are not these flowers. We have a whole new open world, open sky. Another feature of the sky. There's never any darkness in it. Nor too much light. When you have your experiences of imagining situations in total darkness, the light, grayish light is always there. That light is actually there whenever you withdraw your attention fully there. The experiences of that state of being are very similar for the different experiencers when we compare notes. So that is why at least we can find out that the sense perceptions work independently from the experience we are having. And therefore, the idealists who said you have to have the vision of a tree before you can actually have a tree were actually correct. But to be personally verified by being in that state and then you to say, what is a tree? That is why to understand who we are, what are the possibilities? The answer is go within, not outside. You can study as many books as you like, gather as much knowledge as you like. It's not an experience. Experience comes when you experience at the right place, at the right spot, inside. When your attention can be withdrawn to third eye center, you can have this experience. That means we have a much longer life. If we were that before we were born and we are still there after dying, Obviously, the life of that form is bigger. We are using a mind right now in the physical body to think, to remember. As I said, to remember the memories which creates life, actually. But do we also have a mind there? I'm only talking of senses. What about mind? Does it still think? Of course it does. That body is still thinking like this body. Mind is still the same. Has the mind changed somewhat? Little bit. What is the change in the mind? It can remember more than this mind can remember here. This mind tries to restrict its memory to physical experiences. 
and we can't even remember that. We can't remember childhood. I can't remember what breakfast I had yesterday. This mind is so poor in memory, when our vision can become so good without physical body, does the mind also become sharp? Sure. The capacity to remember increases. The most beautiful experience that one has at that time, you can remember time before your birth in the physical body and know where you were in that body, not in the physical body. Personal experience through a memory of the same mind in another form of what happened 100 years ago, 200 years ago. Now, people who have done these exercises, and lots of them in India who do that, have estimated that the physical life is very short. 100, 120 years, maybe maximum will be 135 years. Some scientists have said you cannot, the body is not designed to live more than 135 years. Some claim by constant organ transplants we can make it much longer. The brain has to be kept the same. If the brain is transplanted, it becomes a different person. Therefore, it's a short time. They say from the memories collected from the other body and their ability to project a future by hoping is at least between 1,000 to 3,000 of physical time. Let's say, supposing that's the average life of an astral body, a sensory body. We should be able to remember old things and make forecasts for future, same way like we do here, but on a different scale. But is that the end of a discovery? It's just an experience. It's only an experience. We're just having an experience through the self operating through sense perceptions without body. It's not knowledge of the self. We have not learned how the self can do that. We have not learned what the self is. So it is not a self-realization. It's merely a different experience which looks more long-standing, looks like it is a longer time version in that, but still an experience. Not, we have not known the experiencer too much. Interesting experiences, very interesting experiences. I can give you details of how that experience, disembodied state, has two parts. One, that is still connected with the physical world. You can see the physical world in their body. We can see physical beings in their body. You can see physical objects in their body because senses are there. But we can also fly and examine the galaxies that are operating right now in the physical body, which we see through physical body. We don't even have telescope to see them, which we can see with the astral body. Great experience. And what makes us do that are our curiosities currently existing now. Not everybody goes to see what is happening on a galaxy or other, other alien civilizations are actually living or not. Not speculation. If that is the ability of our inner body, consisting only of perceptions, sense perceptions, and can fly anywhere at very high speed, higher than the speed of light, because we can generate locations with the mind and that body. So that is why it's a very amazing experience. Who would like to see if on a, another galaxy, another planet existing out there, there's pe people like us living or not? Anybody interested? Wow, I was interested too, I must tell you. <laughs> there are people living there. You can go and see them. Little different, depending upon which planet you land on. These planets are merely revolving objects around the suns which are stars. And these planets have contained life and a very unique life and very far separated by time space. Very far separated because each becomes an independent unit of life. Life elsewhere does not mean that the souls are different. That's the same principle of life. Souls are the same. Very often the minds are the same. Sense perceptions can be different. And the nature of 
existence there may be separate. For example, in one of the one of the alien population has a very strange experience that they have a device developed by which they can freeze time. We can't do it. We have not reached that moment at all. It may take 1,000 years, maybe 2,000 years, maybe more. Maybe we won't, have, we won't have it on this planet at all. But that planet has, is populated by people having a device by which if they like something, suppose they like to see these flowers longer, flowers are just moving, they can stop. When we were little children, we used to play a game called freeze. So if somebody shouted freeze, we had to stop exactly where we were. When unfreeze, we could move again. In that, you don't have to shout. Every person can do that. So what happens? This solves the problem which current scientists have in the physical world, that we can move on time at will also, like in space. Their, their definition of the continuum of space-time is correct, but they don't know how to explain that time functions differently than space. There you'll find they both function the same way. And they're using it routinely. Like we are using, put on a light, put on the switch. Nobody examines how can light come by putting on a switch. Such a complicated thing. Nobody is going to investigate how electricity was, electricity was de developed. We're taking it for granted. Little children know more, more about the iPhone and the computers than the adults know. It's just an advancement of civilization to that point. It does not mean that necessarily they have gone through the same process we are going. They have different forms. Similar, but different. So that is why, wouldn't it be, now so many of you raise your hands. It's possible to have that examination of other life forms and other places, other universes. You'll find some remarkable things. You'll find that in some universes, now don't be too surprised, you are also existing, but you're not aware of it. You have put your attention on one universe, on one created universe, place on planet Earth, born in such a such place, growing up with these parents, this destiny, and therefore you are here. What has brought you here? Why not there if you're also there at the same time, the same moment? Your attention is totally 100% here. If you put your attention there, you're going to be there also. Can we do that also? Of course, the whole power to experience anything, anywhere, in the whole of creation, lies in the power of attention. Where you place your attention, you can experience that. Meditation is not a simple way of seeing lights and colors. Meditation opens up the totality of creation, and eventually, if you're on the right track with the right master, the totality of your own self. That's the possibility that opens up. I'm sharing these simple experiences because the experiences go much deeper than that. If you can withdraw your attention from the physical body and open up the sensory systems by themselves without matter, would you also be able to withdraw your attention from the sense perceptions and go to pure mental perception. Yes, that can be done. Not many masters have come in this world to do that. Many of us, including religions, have advised you can reach heaven. After death, you can reach heaven if you do good deeds. Absolutely true. But all the heavens are in the astral plane, in the plane where you have the sense perceptions, but not matter. Therefore, very few people in this created planet here have been able to go beyond this world of sense perceptions. But there is a world higher than that. Few people have gone. The world where sense perception disappear and merge into a single perception of the mind. That's the world of the mind. All things that can be perceived 
by means of the mind or sense perceptions or they are sitting in the physical body are being originated there. It's the world of the mind. We also refer to it as the causal world, causal level of consciousness. The word causal is used because that's the cause of all experiences as we have defined. Experience does not exist anywhere else except in the causal world of the mind. After that, it's not it's being, not experience. To go to the soul, we have to go beyond that. To go to discover who, who is having the experience. Is it one or many? Are we part of one? Or really we have separated many? These questions still remain. Even after these wonderful experiences of withdrawing your awareness from the physical body and even being able to withdraw your attention from the sense perceptions and going to the world of mind. But this is a very deep subject. Up to the mind, I can explain to you everything as best as I can. Beyond that, I have no words to describe. There are no, no language to describe things happening in zero time space. Our mind understanding does not function without time and space. The mind has a limit. And the limitation of the mind is it cannot operate at all without time and space. The smallest thought, which is an activity of the mind, takes time. There are experiences happening to us right now which are not in time and space, such as falling in love with somebody. Did you think about it? How does the experience of love come when you haven't even thought about it? How long did it take? No time. So love is an experience that's going on not only here, not only in the sensory system, not only in the mind, even beyond. There are some functions we are having here which go even beyond the mind. What about intuition? What about suddenly having a gut feeling without time? Just feeling, this is it. Where does it come from? No thoughts involved. No time space involved. Where does this come from? We translate it into mental language by thinking about it. We translate it into sensory language by saying, I can see it. We translate it into physical action, action and make it something different. But intuitive knowledge comes from somewhere else. How do we appreciate beauty suddenly? Look at Beautiful. Do we take time? No. And thinking about it, yes, we take time. How did we find its beauty? We take time. Sometime by thinking about it, we destroy the very beauty we have seen. Here's, here's a picture of my master. I look one glance and I can see the picture. I don't analyze it. Is that a beard? Is that an eye? I'm not analyzing it. I'm seeing one picture, instantly. Now supposing I took this picture out of the frame, cut into pieces, one inch squares, and put this whole picture on this table. I can't see the picture. It cut into pieces. Now supposing I start looking at the picture from this little pieces, one by one, one by one, I can see the pieces thousands of times and not see the picture. What has happened? It's the same picture. We divided it. We analyzed it. We split it. The picture was an experience of one image. We divide it. How are we not, how are we not seeing this whole creation and creator at once? We divided it. Dividing into what? Moments, hours, days, time, and space. Time and space are dividing a single experience, which can be had if you were above the mind. The single experience is not Away from anywhere, we all have it, right inside. The mind is helping us to divide. Mind always analyzes. For analysis, mind has to divide, to study. Love synthesizes. Intuition synthesizes, puts it together. And all the functions are taking place here, 
in the inner body, in the mind, and beyond in the soul. Isn't it great? What a great adventure to be able to have all this experience. And all lying within ourselves. Nothing outside at all. <coughs> this is such an interesting subject. I sometimes wonder if people have read about it, why don't they try it? They read so much. We read and we read. My daughter has gone to Hawaii yesterday to celebrate her 22nd year of marriage. Send me photos. I see the photos. I see my daughter. I see my daughter on the beach, Waikiki Beach. I can see it thousand times I will not be on the beach and not have the same experience. Reading cannot give you the experience of what you are reading. Images cannot show you what they are. It's very poor, poor representation than going there. We are reading about consciousness, reading about other experiences, reading more and more about those experiences. We don't reach there by reading. If I want to go to Hawaii and keep on reading, see all the time schedules of all the airlines and study all the books on where they are, study all the hotels and amenities available, I'm not there. But that's what we are doing with spirituality. <laughs> Just going on reading more and the intellectual abs absorption of some concepts and concepts generated by us about those books are all we are getting. We are not getting any experiences at all. And concepts can be very different. When I give a talk to say 10 people and ask them, please write down one sentence of what I talked, all 10 are different. Same talk. Why should be the 10 answers? At one time, I was in a civil servant position in India where I was also trying in charge of the police system. And we instructed the police officers and the intelligence officers, never send your reports verbally, always in writing. What was the reason? We did an exercise. 20 well-trained senior police officials sat together. We wrote a message that is, package has been found near a bridge. Simple, very short message. Now you transmit only by ear to the next person and keep that here. As 20 translations, that place has been bombed away. Package exploded in the middle somewhere. <laughs> These are trained people. We tested and therefore we said, you must write everything. We also, you don't mind if I crack a little joke with you? Some of you have heard some. This is during my training, I'm telling you what happened. This is during police training, training of intelligence of officials. You must always send message in writing. Once a madman caught hold of a washerwoman who was washing her clothes there on the river, raped her, and ran away. People were asked to write the shortest way to describe this incident. Some said, madman ray and came here to this, many words. The instructor said this can be sent in a very simple way. Not cruise, nuts, screws, washer, and bolts. Simple way. Simplest way of writing. This is because by reading, we get the description of things, but we don't uh, really know what it is. Then in philosophy, where we try to explain these inner things, we use even more words. And if you be, happen to be in a job with diplomatic, involved diplomacy, the number of words increases. The diplomats very often write notes so long that by the end you don't know what they wrote. Maybe it's a, it is because they want to confuse. They want to have their options open. They'll keep on describing things and give so many possibilities. And that is part of their training. But 
all types of reading all types of writing can find us to the place where we are sitting right where we are no information that has been turned into practice no information that has made us realize what is the potential within us you have to practice you have to practice what you are reading we read our scriptures and we think reading of scriptures will take us somewhere nobody is going anywhere we not even read we go to our church to a temple to synagogue to mosque to hear to hear somebody else reading some of us listen many don't because they have come to play their to pay their tribute to the god whom they worship and their presence is good now go home and be the same angry person same problems with your lust greediness and all those things are still the same and we say we have been to our temple and church and synagogue what are we getting and what the man is saying is what we should be practicing i go to a church at least on christmas eve because it's a beautiful it's, it's one of the denominational churches which of course i don't care because ultimately they say there's god and there's christ and there is the truth some people don't i told my friends i am going to the methodist church we don't go there we are lutherans we are baptists do you know same god has been divided into so many pieces by our denominations i have muslim friends i don't go and see that man he is shia i am sunni i am shia he is sunni same allah same god we how are we acting even with the knowledge that is actually written down in our scriptures and we are still dividing ourselves and hating each other when the scriptures are talking all of love and beauty and oneness so very very strange that we should be not using that for practice john's gospel in the bible gives a clear definition of god people have said has god been properly described i said yes in the bible in john's gospel opening verses the opening verses say in the beginning was the word word w o r d word and the word was god and all things were done first he says the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god all things were made by him and nothing was made that was not made by him total creation take place from a word what word what word created this whole universe i looked up a dictionary big dictionary i said the bigger it is the better definition word with w capital word means the bible the book how can a book create the whole universe how can anything recorded so recently about 2000 years ago be the creation creation of something that existed for billions of years and yet we are satisfied with that we are so much trapped in external vision external absorption of information and not even practicing on what it is saying if we want to understand the same bible saying that this body is the kingdom of a living god we should follow that all scriptures i have studied and i happened to got interested when i went to the university harvard university i studied 11 religions to see there will be some common things like how to go within about the love intuition coming from different sources i was searching all 11 scriptures religion histories histories of their origin 11 religion major religion of the world i found only one thing common in all 11 of them common thing was we are the only true ones all other the false only common thing i could find none of them were talking of the real thing and they all incorporating the real thing and yet 
spirituality from where it was started became religion by these means by division spirituality unites religion had divided it's very unfortunate that this should have been so but if you practice what they say go within yourself and what's the meaning of going within exactly as i'm saying going within your own self not outside somewhere this is the real temple this body this is the real church the real synagogue the real mosque in which you can find the truth and you will find the truth according to your scriptures if you go within we don't practice it now i was just alluding to different experiences one can have with the astral body one can have much bigger experiences with the mind alone and it is open to us we we'll understand what all we have inside us we are confined to such a small slice of experience available to us just by sitting in the physical body and saying that's all we have i tell you if you ask me the greatest miracle i have seen is a miracle that we have a human body because in no other form can i see this possibility of having these experiences except in a human form soul is life plants are living outside they are not finding this animals birds big and small all have life all have soul same soul form is confining them what happens in a human form in a human form we have ignorance big benefit ignorance of the future ignorance of what is predetermined so we think we are determining now this creates a great experience called free will if we knew the future there will be no free will we we'll know it's already there we are going to go that way anyway sometimes people associate free will with outside events that we can change them a man came to me my destiny says i have to go to that place so planned i'm changing it i've changed with my free will i've changed my destiny i said go inside and see the destiny it's all predetermined in the causal plane you know what the destiny will say that you will speak these words i am destined to go there now change my mind it's predestined to think like that we think change by th thinking is predetermined why we make options they look like your real options now they predetermined i want to give an example of this and then we break for lunch the example i'm giving is my personal experience in india there are some people called bhatras some of you heard the story already that group of people is called bhatra bhatra they have arranged a special type of understanding or through different kinds of uh, meditational techniques by which they can read minds read minds of people and they can surprise you by telling you what you are thinking and some of them are more advanced and they can do something which one bhatra did to me i had gone for uh, a training course in in the indian navy which i was going to join but then i switched over and when i was coming out of that with a little piece of paper in my hands this man with a turban and a beard he appeared he said good luck good luck i said you belong to my own state why are you speaking english he said i am speaking english because you have good luck he said wait do you have a piece of paper yes i have he gave a piece of paper any pen pencil yes and he began to look at my eyes and write something small piece folded it refolded it small he said hold this in your hand i had in my hand now write a number between 1 and 10 i said this is an old trick i know these people expect i'll write the middle number 5 i have seen that i am not going to be <laughs> i would call off his bluff i wrote 3 
write the name of a flower. I said, most common flower is rose. He's expecting me to write that rose. I'll write the name of a flower that doesn't even exist where he is from. So one flower we call Chameli, C-H-A-M-E-L-I. I wrote C-H-A-M in capitals. Write your date of birth. I wrote 1926. He looked, no, this is the year of birth. Write your date of birth. So I added my date of birth after the year. Normally I don't write like that, but when I had already written the year of birth, I wrote the name. Open the paper I gave you. Open the paper. Three, Chameli in capitals, 1926, and the date after that. Identical to what he had written earlier. I was naturally completely baffled. Because he wrote that when I didn't even think about these things. I worked in my mind. How could he possibly know in advance what is going to happen five minutes later? Completely stopped. I said, will you please explain how this happens? I'm very interested in how you do it. He said, let me tell you a little more. I said, all right. When I asked you to write a number, you said I'm going to call off his bluff. He thinks I'll write five, I'll write three. He repeated my thought. <laughs> when I said write the name of a flower, you thought he most common flower is rose. He repeated my thought, which he never heard in my head. And he repeated all the thoughts of mine. I got more baffled. I said, how can you even know before I thought that I'll think like this? And I tried to be his friend and tried to give him some money and tried to make him happy so he could share something. So he told me that there is a method of meditation in which we can see five, ten minutes of another person's thoughts to come. I said, but when I haven't even thought, how can you see thought to come? He said, that's what you think, that your thoughts are coming new. The way thoughts come, the way your decisions are made, the way you think you're making a choice with your thoughts, all pre-recorded. He demonstrated to me. I can never forget that how even thoughts, even what we say is we can change these things. Every kind of thought, what is pre-recorded is not events, even the thoughts and events. When we find that, then what has happened? Just because we don't know what we will think in the future, what we will do with those thoughts in the future, ignorance of that is making us have we have free will. That means free will is not real. If it were real, he couldn't have guessed at all. He couldn't have said the thoughts are pre-written. There is a free will. If there is no free will, why does the law of karma stand which says if you do good, you are rewarded? If you do bad, you are punished. If it's all pre-written. You should not be punished for something pre-written. You should not be rewarded for something that is not your doing, but pre-written. Predetermination is a great, great clash with moral values. It clashes with everything that we have been understanding about life and ethics and so on. How do you justify it? Well, the justification comes when we can go further in advancement in our meditation and discover nobody else wrote it, we wrote it. No other conscious being was there sitting to make our destiny, we made it. And we can also find the place where we made it. In fact, we made all the destinies, each one of us. There's no each one of us later, but right now we're each one of us. Each one of us has made all the possible destinies that exist. And we picked up one just for experiencing one time. That's an interesting, interesting thing. It's like inducing a dream and saying, I'm going to dream something up and down. doesn't matter what the dream is. We wake up to the reality. It doesn't matter what the destiny was. If we are going to wake up to saying, <clears throat> we just made it for an experience, which is the truth. <clears throat> we made this destiny, but right now we are blocked from knowing who is we, who is the self. 
when we discover the self, all the answers come right from there. How? There's only one self. Total self. Consisting of total knowledge, which we can call intuitive knowledge, very bad description, but still intuitive. Total knowledge, total love, total beauty, total bliss. One. Word one is not appropriate. The moment we say one, the concept of many comes immediately. We have no word. Let's say total. Totality of consciousness. Supposing we describe that oneness as totality of consciousness. Is love, but not the experience of love. Knowledge, but not the experience of knowledge. Beauty, but not the experience of beauty. Converts within itself. The recipients of what it is, the experience of love, the experience of beauty, the experience of knowledge, creates the many within itself. All those things which are this self become also an experience of the self. Wonderful justification for creating the many out of the one. Then, then there's no limit. The many can be dressed up in any costume you like. Put on a costume of a mind, create space and time. Put on another costume of sense perceptions, make it even more interesting. Put on a third costume of a human body to make it a solid material experience. Wonderful. Has it really happened like that? The answer can only come if you are there. And where is there? I am pointing out like this. What a wrong direction to point to. <laughs> there. All in sight. Nothing outside, all inside, open to all of us, no exceptions. Nobody is specially gifted. These gifts are with every one of us. All humanity, irrespective of nationality, irrespective of color of the skin, irrespective of the culture, the language, all of us have the same thing. And we can, any one of us, through this experience. And these people who have actually experienced <clears throat> they found out how to make it simpler. Simpler techniques of meditation have been given to have these experiences. I'll continue my conversation with you for a little while after lunch. If you have any question on what I've said or I've, or I've missed to say, you can write the question. I'll try to answer those. Do we have arrangement for Okay. They have some little, little cards on which you can write. If any one of you has any question, you can write. I'll try to answer either today or tomorrow. I'll be here for two days. Thank you very much for very patient listening. I'll join you in the afternoon about 3 o'clock. Enjoy your lunch.